Robert Sapolsky, the great position of no free will and no I, versus Bergson, who disagrees. And because there's no I, well, that brings in Zen. So let's see. Just a quick note on the state of this channel, which is kind of dead. Seems to be on YouTube's do not recommend list. The last two videos I did, Twin Paradox, Key Concepts, very short, kind of a YouTube test to see if I could get a lot of larger audience. I didn't really expect my brilliant set of subscribers to uh, be that interested because I've obviously covered these particular concepts before. The Twin Paradox, for example, 205 views. But look at these others. 5.4 million views, 306,000, 35,000, 59,000, 22,000. An SEO score problem, search engine optimization, supposed to be a big thing, consists of description, keywords, hashtags, et cetera, get all that right and cool, get a higher SEO score, but all these that I just showed have an SEO score of zero. So not sure what the difference is, engagement, quote unquote. Truth is no one really knows how YouTube actually works to suggest things, but I'll just keep on trying for a while. We shall see. So actual intro. Robert Sapolsky, American neuroendocrinology researcher, author, professor of biology, neurology, neurobiological sciences, and neurosurgery at uh, Stanford University. Spent years and years and years studying baboons, I think it is. Quite a guy all over YouTube on the subject of free will, or rather, no free will. Just a smattering here. Just a smattering. It's the rage. Surely linked with the current zeitgeist, in my opinion, that we and our brain are just inefficient AIs. And of course, AIs have no free will. Totally determined. To me, Sapolsky is a variant of Dennett. Dennett accepts a Laplacian deterministic vision completely. That is, the universe is pre-programmed. Once we know the initial conditions and the physics equations, we can sit on its path, place itself out. There's no room for variation or free choice, not even a road. That is, it's a rail track. Nevertheless, Dennett, for example, spends many pages attempting to convince us, in essence, that if we move up to the macro level of experience, the world of golf ball putting and making decisions in the stock market or poker playing, that things are so complicated that we are effectively free. But his entire discussion produces one of the great cognitive dissonance headaches ever achieved as he feverishly attempts to keep our eyes averted from his Laplacian world looking, lurking, always driving everything beneath his world of macro appearances, beneath the golf ball putting. Sapolsky doesn't pretend, however, that we're even effectively free. Beneath everything, beneath all the biology, lurks the Laplacian matrix. But let's look at this interchange in this particular uh, video on does fuel exist. We'll see why Dr. Uh, Sapolsky, Dr. S, simply lacks the vision of Bergson. So in this video, in this discussion, Sapolsky has just gone on and on about all the biological factors determining a decision, say to eat a bunch of kale versus a handful of M&Ms. The interviewer asks, to me that sounds like deep influence. So my state, whether I'm fatigued, hungry, whether my testosterone is elevated or not, that the state of being a person is in, that confluence shapes or influences my decision. And this is where I'm squaring agency, meaning I decide as opposed to I'm deeply influenced, and you're saying determined to choose the kale over the M&Ms. So how do you square that? All the influence that lead up to the moment you take action are you are determined to take the next actual step, as opposed to you're more influenced, you might imagine. So influence versus determina determination. Sapolsky, well, the stance you've got is one of the most one most people will go to if they like reflect on the fact that we manipulated them into choosing X instead of Y. And whoa, how do I make sense of all this? All this stuff that came before his influence is bending me in one direction and modulating my likelihood. And at the end, what I have is the image of people have had for centuries. It's a little man inside the head, a little homunculus, a little soul inside the machine. 
So he's characterizing the people that hold assist influences. And yeah, it pays attention to the news and it tries to read up on like science, blurbs in people, magazines to try to stay up with stuff. And you get kind of sleepy if he reads too much about it. And yeah, uh, and getting distracted because there's an itchy mosquito bite on his ankle and, and that he got last night. And so, yeah, he's going to make a decision. And oh, Christ, let's see what the genes have to tell us. And he's going on about that. And what did mom have to say to me? And he's going on about that. And he thinks about, and then he says, okay, here's what I'm going to do. Continuing, this notion that there's a you in there sitting separate from all this biology gunk. Yeah, this biology gunk in there, sometimes it's pretty impressive because it's really loud or sometimes it really hurts, but there's a you in there. There's a you there that's separate from all that. It can sit there and somewhere in there is the captain of the ship. And there's no you in there. People have gone looking for it. The people who like to try to do the neurobiology of consciousness. There's no thing in there that's separate from the sum of all that stuff. Even though it sure is something that it feels like when you eat the M&Ms. And we feel, note that sentence, and we feel like we've been a failure. Or when we go to, for the kale and we feel like we have more self-discipline than the average human walking around on this planet. Because we function very easily as though there's a me in there. We're influenced by this stuff and we ultimately decide. And there's no me there. There's nothing separate from all that stuff going on. So the interviewer says, yeah, yeah, that's kind of your first principle. That's where your kind of first principle originates. That's where, that, that there's not a consciousness. There's not a me or a watchless watcher. There's not the I in the system. So beneath all the biology, there lies this, the Laplacian grinding deterministic framework of particle or little billiard ball interactions. And there's no I to be found in this. The I is an illusion, per Sapolsky. The illusion is interesting. For as Dr. S admits, it feels like something. It can feel like I'm stirring coffee with a spoon. That's my I. So firstly, the I is intricately related to our experience, which is our sentience of the cup, of stirring, of drinking. What is our image, which is our image of the external world? But Dr. S has no theory of this, the origin of the sentient qualia filled image of the external world. No theory, I guarantee you. This is simply, as I've noted many times, the more general statement of the hard problem, the origin of our image of the external world, aka sentience, aka qualia field, dynamic forms changing, etc. And it's intrinsically part of the illusion of the eye. It is our eye. Hard to separate the two, isn't it? So Dr. S is making a virtue in his argument of the failure to solve the hard problem and founding his argument on this failure. Interesting move. So Dr. S not only cannot find the eye in the billiard balls which are clashing in the brain, which he, most neurobiology researchers can't find, but finds correlatedly then there's no coffee stirring in there as well, no experience. With Bergson, we know why there is no coffee stirring in the brain, and we know why we have the external image of coffee stirring. Why? In Bergson's model, I'll just be real short, because we're embedded in a holographic field that's transforming indivisibly over time. And the brain serves as a modulated reconstructive wave passing through that field, just like it's passing through the hologram in the box above. And that's specific to a source within the external field, actually within the past of the external field. In this case, as a reconstructive wave is specific to the cup and the stirring spoon. And that cup is right where it says it is, external, within the field. In other words, in Bergson's conception, we're not explaining how perception arises, but how it is limited. Because the holographic field has these properties of essentially perception. Whence the origin then of the illusionary eye? Well, as infants, 
our body is placed within this dynamically transforming field. The task of perception becomes identify objects upon which we can act. A spoon, a bottle, a rattle, evolutionary, evolutionarily important. That is, the task is to partition the field into objects and their motions. In this matrix of constant change, our body becomes the invariant. Identity, the I, settles upon the body. And why is this I free? Nature of time. For Sapolsky, say what? Time? Time does not enter into Sapolsky's world. The field in which the body is intrinsically embedded is transforming indivisibly, like a melody, each instant note permeating the next, each reflective of the past instance. This is not the classic metaphysic of space and time. The classic metaphysic, where space is a 3D continuum of points and positions, where time is the fourth dimension of the space, the series of instants, each corresponding to an instantaneous state of space. As that object moves from, forth, from the front to the back, that kind of cup, each instant along its motion, each point as it that it, that it, on its trajectory corresponds to an instant of time, which in turn corresponds to an instant of the entirety of space taken over that instant or across that instant. And that each instant of the, is a mathematical point in its extent in time. Each space is a mathematical point in extent and duration. So such a state, an instantaneous space, cannot cause the next state. Each state is frozen, never to move again. This is where, as Bergson noted, Descartes thought, well, this is where you need a god to create each cube, cube after cube after cube, each state of space over time, instant by instant. But this is the metaphysic underlying Laplace. It's the only metaphysic which allows the determination of each state after state after state, because you need an instantaneous frozen state, else everything is always indeterminate. You, there's always constant change, no matter how tiny the interval. So Bergson said physics fools itself. It cannot escape continuous creation. We must wait, for example, for the sugar to dissolve. The glass is only isolated from the entire rest of the external field, the holographic field, in abstraction. It, the glass and that sugar dissolving is part and parcel intrinsically inter interconnected with the entirety of the universe. And he said, the duration of the universe, that is the pace unfolding, must therefore be one with the latitude of creation, which can find place in it. We, our body, are intrinsic particip participants in this creative dynamic transformation. There is no true spatial separation of objects within this ever-changing field. The distinct outlines for us are only practical for the sake of action. For Bergson, subject differentiates from object only in terms of time, not space. This seems counterintuitive, but the uh, Minkowski diagram, for example, of space-time is scaleless. Physics, physics likes to visualize it as tiny little billiard ball of particles, but at another scale, at another level of scale, we're talking about the scale of bottles and rattles and buzzing flies. That's a specific scale of time imposed by the body. And in that imposition of scale, we begin to differentiate subject from object. But our normal sense of this I can change, can expand. Intense concentration on a koan in the Zen framework, for example, who is it that sees? We get interesting results, for example, from one Zen master. I came to realize clearly that mind is no other than mountains and rivers in the great wide earth, the sun and the moon and the stars. Another from the three pillars of Zen, I'm supremely free, free, free. There is no common person. The big clock chimes, not the clock, but mind chimes. The universe itself chimes. There is neither mind nor universe. Ding, dong, dong. I'm, I've totally disappeared. Buddha is the substance of mind. 
This is now luminously clear to me. Or take the author of Zen of the Brain, James Austin. He's sitting by a train station, and this is his experience instantly. The entire view acquires three qualities, absolute reality, intrinsic rightness, ultimate reflection. With no transition, it is all complete. Yes, there is the paradox of this extraordinary viewing, but there is no viewer. The scene is utterly empty, stripped of every last extension of an I, me, mine. His name from Ego Self. Vanished in one split second is this is a familiar sensation that this person is viewing a city scene. The, near, the new viewing proceeds impersonally, not pausing to register the paradox that there is no human subject doing it. So, in the specification of the external world, as a holographic wave, where everything is where it says it is, the coffee cup out there, or for that matter, the train station out there, we strip away that sense of I, and we become, as Jacob Bain says there, if you regard you, if you look at your own self, you will see that with regard to your external being, you are that external world. Another mystic, Jacob Bain. It's doubtful that Dr. S is aware of Austin's extensive discussion of the neuroscience behind this. We went through this in number 24 in Zen, the Brain, and Berkson. Yes, we are beings far beyond Sapolsky's limited, classic metaphysic-based, supposedly scientific conception. A full script. On reading about Sapolsky and Wiki, I noticed an entry that led to this. American neuroendocrinology researcher Robert Sapolsky in his essay included in the book The Trouble with Testosterone and Other Essays on the Biology of the Human Predicament suggests the occurrence of schizotypal, that half-crazy behavior in metamagical thinking in Jesus and other charismatic religious leaders, which would include every Zen Buddhist that ever existed. So I suppose the Zen Satori is simply schizotypal too. With regard to Christ, I would yet hold, and I still hold, and I do hold, that the physical evidence embodied all through the shroud, embedded all through the shroud of Turin, is critical. It's the starting point. It's a must deal with question. You have no clue, in my opinion, and I may, be, yes, maybe further discoveries will, will not, not bear this out, but right now there is no scientific explanation of the shroud other than one that is, well, remarkable. So when you can explain the shroud, I would say, and when, when Sapolsky can, well, maybe then you can mock or float your schizotypal theories. Or more likely at that point, you cannot. Again, there's just more to this universe than Dr. S has even begun to consider. So again, let me point you to this book for a deeper discussion of all this on Amazon, especially in the context of AI. We'll see what we do next time.